So welcome everyone. This is the 2022 CCC webinar on debriefing your run. So this is really um, intended to be an overview of, you know, sort of at this stage, you know, late November, looking back at your run or a campaign that you were a part of, whether you're a candidate or a, or a very involved volunteer and thinking about what, how are the ways that we should debrief and basically learn lessons from our campaigns and how can we take those lessons and move them into the future and for both future campaigns and our general overall organizing. So just for some housekeeping, I'm gonna ask that folks mute themselves. I do have a presentation that I'm gonna go through so I will share screen. And then because we're, you know, we're a fairly small group, feel free to, you know, raise your hand, interrupt. Um, we can certainly open it up for dialogue and discussion um, at any point. You know, it could be at the end, but if you have something that you really, you know, point you want to make in the middle, that's fine too. Um, this presentation is a collaboration. It sort of it started with content that I developed many years ago, and then a couple of years ago, Gloria Matera and Michael O'Neill, both from the New York State Green Party. Uh, took this and kind of added their own um, spin to it. And then I've sort of since taken it back. So it's a kind of hodgepodge of content that was developed by both myself as well as Gloria and Michael. So just want to make sure I give them credit. All right. So what is debriefing? So basically, we're talking about a systematic process. And so let me emphasize the systematic process part um, to learn lessons and think about our past actions or activities. And why do we want to debrief? Because obviously we want to think about, well, what worked and what didn't, you know, we want to learn our lessons and um, hopefully be able to incorporate those for future runs. Um, there's a great quote from the popular educator, Miles Horton, that you only learn from the experiences you learn from. And um, so, you know, reflection and debriefing is certainly part of that uh, process to really think about what actually happened, why or why not, and what is it that we can learn to make sure that we either repeat success or avoid, you know, mistakes and, and challenges. Um, and that, you know, putting, you know, in an ideal situation when you're planning from the very beginning, debriefing is actually part of your calendar. Um, if you haven't done that yet, it's, whoops, admit, back where we were. Um, if you haven't done that yet, it's not too late you know, you can still figure out a way to do, um, you know, a formal debrief for your campaign, even if you haven't already scheduled that. And then, you know, the who is involved, I think, um, you know, you can cast the net as wide as you want to, want to. I think certainly you want to at least include your core committee, sort of your, you know, the leadership who, who is maybe meeting on a somewhat regular basis, helping you plan the campaign. So we're not talking about like every single volunteer you mobilized, but maybe like the, you know, five to 10 people who were your sort of go-to folks who had, you know, leadership roles in your campaign um, that were active, you know, throughout the process. All right, so I'm recommending, and I, there's definitely more than one way to debrief. Um, that you want to, I, I, my preference is always a face-to-face -face meeting. I find that, you know, humans are social creatures and that we definitely respond better to each other face-to-face. -face. Obviously, that's not always possible, particularly if you're running a statewide campaign and you have people who are hundreds of miles away from each other. So obviously, in, you know, today's day and age, the Zoom thing works just fine. Um, but I, my other reason for sort of suggesting face-to-face -face is that it also can take time, right? Like a good thorough debrief of what might have been a year long process could take a, at least a whole day. And it's kind of hard to keep people on Zoom and occupied for six, seven, eight hours. So you also might have to then instead adapt and do it in small chunks, like debrief, you know, one part of the campaign and then another few days later do something different. Um, I would say ideally it is facilitated by a trusted neutral third party. Um, the candidate should not be the facilitator. Um, it's very hard to, you know, you want someone who can be a little bit dispassionate and who didn't, didn't know all the gory details of everything that happened, who maybe doesn't have a stake in the conversation to be able to facilitate things and keep them, you know, keep the conversation flowing. Um, 
campaigns can get very heated and emotional. There's a lot of, you know, there's, it's a high stakes, you know, kind of process. And depending on how, you know, serious and, you know, how serious the campaign was, you know, emotions run high. And, you know, even, you know, weeks later, months later, people can look back and feel, you know, there's a lot of feelings. And so having somebody who can be that sort of trusted third party is often, um, you know, to your advantage. Um, as I mentioned, you want to allow enough time, you know, you cannot necessarily do a thorough debrief of every single element of the campaign. Um, it, you know, it's a big process, but you do want to give people time to kind of, you know, warm up, get into it, pick apart different parts of the campaign, bring people back together, you know, really, you know, have people leaving on a high note and not feeling, you know, burned out, even more burned out and used at the end of the day. And so I think, you know, you can certainly create an agenda that is a full day. And you can also include other forms of feedback. So it doesn't have to be just like an in-person meeting or a conference, but you can do surveys and other things. In fact, one year I was a part of a campaign here in Philadelphia where we did a survey of all the volunteers who we mobilized on election day to get us, give us in more information about, you know, how do they felt like they were communicated with, you know, did they felt like they had the, the materials that they needed and the information, you know, just sort of what that process was like. Um, we unfortunately were not consistent and we didn't have not done that same survey year after year, but that is something that you can also incorporate into sort of an overall um, you know, analysis and write up of a, of a campaign. Um, and ideally you want to do it soon. You know, like you don't want people to have forgotten, um, what happened. <laughs> um, but you also want a little bit of a break. You know, people are really burned out and tired after the campaign. And so, you know, I, my recommendation is ideally before Thanksgiving, of course, we're at this point already after Thanksgiving, but definitely by the end of the year. So, you know, January is not, you know, nothing, it's never too late, but I would say if you haven't done this yet, if you can pull something off in the next, you know, week or two, um, that would be ideal. All right, so here's a sample agenda. I mean, by no means do you have to take this word for word. You can certainly adapt and do your own thing. Um, and, you know, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. If you can't, you know, get a bunch of people together for eight hours straight in the next two weeks, that doesn't mean that you can't have these conversations even, you know, in, in, you know, in part. Um, so you obviously want to bring people together and sort of warm them up and that kind of thing. But then, you know, I'm always a fan of starting with the positives, right? You don't want to necessarily dive right into the challenges and what was hard. Um, so what are your, like, you know, thinking about the whole campaign, what actually worked well? What were the successes? And you can think about this in a number of different ways where you can, you know, do quantifiable metrics, right? Um, you know, even if you didn't necessarily achieve your goals, you still hopefully had some successes. You know, I heard, um, you know, Sherry was talking about the number of votes they got in order to retain ballot status, right? Things like that. Um, you know, maybe it was just that folks learned more about how to do a particular role. Maybe you learned more about, you know, voter ID or you learn more about writing press releases, um, all kinds of different, you know, successes can be had. And so you want to definitely start off with getting people to think about what worked well. And then, but you do want to like, not just do that in a vacuum, you want to actually compare it to what your goals were. And this can be hard if you didn't actually have articulated goals at the beginning of the campaign. But to the extent that you did, you know, sometimes the campaign is just like, oh, our goal is to win, right? Well, what, how many votes would, would that have taken? And, you know, now in hindsight, you can look very clearly and see the number of votes that it would have taken to win. And so it is also helpful to not just look at your metrics and look at things by themselves, but to then also look at them in the larger context of what, what your goals were and what was actually needed. And so, um, and I'd say for anybody on listening to the call now who is not really thinking about debriefing, but actually using this as a way to think about a future run, um, you know, this is sort of the time where, you know, begin with the end in mind, right? Have those actual, you know, written goals of what you're trying to achieve in your campaign so that months later you can actually do that kind of comparison.
right? So some of the things that you might have had goals around or you might be thinking about for the future is like obviously number of votes, right? Like that's pretty standard and cut and dry. But there's other kinds of metrics, particularly in the Green Party, where we want to be, you know, party building at the same time. And I see Sherry in the chat saying, will this PowerPoint be sent to us? Yes, we can do that for sure. Um, so yeah, number of votes, but things like number of volunteers and donors recruited, right? Um, you know, maybe you had a goal, goal of getting the Green Party to penetrate into a part of your district that you just really didn't have a whole lot of, you know, um, activity in before, right? Um, you know, especially if it was a large statewide campaign, maybe you didn't really ever have chapters in rural parts of the state, or you didn't have a chapter in this, in this, you know, in this city, but you did over here. Um, maybe have you developed those, you know, new bases of support? Um, maybe actually converting people into new members, new donors, the number of donations, all of these things can be measured. Um, you know, visibility, social media hits, actual press pickups, those kinds of things. And sometimes Green Party campaigns have other kinds of goals around moving the needle on an issue, right? Like really trying to push the conversation about some particular possibly local issue. And so that's another, it's a little harder to measure that, but you can take a look at you know, news articles and mentions of that issue. Did your opposition candidate like actually change position on something? Like, did you push someone on an issue? Um, you know, it's a little harder to tease out, but that's something that you can also take a look at. All right. Um, and then I think you kind of have to make some choices. So I think even, even if you took a whole eight hour day, you're still not going to be able to touch on all the different aspects of your campaign and sort of do them justice. And so, and later I have a list of like all the different aspects of a campaign. What I would say is like pick three to five, you know, and in my experience, most Green Party campaigns don't have the bandwidth to do like, you know, all 10 or 15 things really well. Um, and so pick the areas that you had activity in, right? Like you don't want to spend two hours debriefing, you know, an example here, social media, if you didn't really do much on social media, I mean, what you're going to say is like, wow, we didn't really do a whole lot of that. Um, so you want to pick things where you did have, um, you know, some, you know, deep activity in whether it's, you know, volunteer mobilization, fundraising, you know, get out the vote, you know, these are all sort of different aspects of your campaign that you could be kind of really thinking about. Um, and then, you know, you, I've seen techniques where, you know, you could pre-select this, you know, you like, you know, if you're sort of planning this with a facilitator, you could sort of pre-select which, which elements you're going to kind of go deep on. You can also do, there's sort of a, a technique around, you know, sort of sticker dot voting where you have like a list of the things that you, that are possible agenda items, and then people get to sort of vote with their feet. There is some kind of fancy math that I can't remember what it, it's like the number of options divided by I want to say the number of people in the room, I can't remember, but you know, you give people like three or four dots basically, and they can go and like, they can bullet vote or not. And you sort of see where the crowd kind of wants to spend their energy. Um, and if those, you know, if there's three sort of three to five things that kind of rise to the, the top, that's where you spend your time. Cause that's clearly what people want to talk about. And then again, depending on the dynamics and the size of your group and you know, how much time you're putting into this, you know, you can also have people do this in small groups. So right, maybe it's, you know, maybe you only have three hours to debrief. And so instead of taking three to five elements in succession, you're sort of all doing them at the same time, kind of in breakout rooms, and then everybody comes back and sort of shares at the end, right? Like that's another possible way to do it. All right. Um, so yeah, you want to have your, if you have small groups, you want to share out those findings. You want to have people react, right? Like, did that track with your experience? You know, this group talked about how we ran our fundraising and they talked about how amazing it was. And, you know, maybe you were involved and you didn't think the fundraising was all that amazing, right? So how, you know, you want to have people sort of react and make sure that, you know, what folks are coming up with seems to resonate and, and track with everybody else in the group. And then most importantly, you want to pivot the conversation to like, all right, how do we change this for the future, right? I mean, mistakes will have been made. I mean, that's just, you know, human nature. Um, most of us are not professional campaigners and even professional campaigners make tons of mistakes. 
a lot of times in the Green Party, this is the, our very first, you know, outing in the political arena. Sometimes we're perennial candidates and we've had people who have run for 10 years straight, but every race is different. And so, you know, there's always a lot of, you know, there's a lot to sort of do hand wring around, hand wringing on and, you know, cast blame. But how do you sort of turn that into something positive, right? How do we think about, well, great. Okay, so that didn't work out so well. So how would we, if we could go back in time and do this again differently, what would it look like? And then write that stuff down, right? Because two years from now, you'll be doing it again or helping somebody else do it again. And you're going to want to know what those, what that great advice was, right? Like you don't want to have to reinvent the wheel or have somebody else make the same mistakes you did two years or two years or four years later. And so, you know, that's the question you want to ask. Like, well, if we were to do this again, how would we do it differently? And, you know, more importantly, are there capacities we need to develop before then? Are there things that we need to know? Like, did we learn that we actually don't know enough about X? Well, what is it that we need to know about? How do we learn those things? Like, this is the time, you know, in the off years, so to speak, not that, you know, in some places there are no off years. I'm speaking of in Pennsylvania, where we go from, you know, sort of statewide and national to then local state, you know, it's like there's never an off time. But to the extent that there is a little bit of an off season, like that's the time where we kind of have to go back and, you know, get our get our muscles, you know, more um, developed for the next run. What are the things that we need to learn in order to be to do this better the next time around? Um, so, yeah, you want to generate takeaways and action items and and it's not just for future candidate runs, but also for the party itself. And so I will talk a bit about how to, you know, translate campaigning into party building. Um, but realize that, you know, some of these lessons learned are certainly for future candidates, but they're also for your local and state party building activities as well. All right, so these are some of the campaign elements that like the, when I say like, oh, pick three to five things that you want to you know, focus on, this is like, a this is the menu of what some of those three to five things are. And there's both external things that you need to think about as well as internal. Um, the external stuff is always harder to, to control, right? Because it's not, you know, it's external, it's beyond your control, but it's things that you have to react to. So, you know, things that you can debrief, like the strengths and weaknesses of your opposition, um, your ability to respond to changing conditions, um, relationship to the party, um, demographics of your campaign and your the electorate, the history of your race and, you know, what's going on in your community. Um, were, you, were you able to get into debates? How did those go? And then one thing you might consider doing, and this could be sort of a closing activity, is a post-campaign power map, which I can talk about later. But that's sort of thinking about who has influence you know, in this district, in this region, with this, you know, in this office, and how can we continue to push our agenda and our platform, quite frankly, even though we didn't win city council, for example, how can we still push the people who did win city council to sort of do the right thing and, you know, put the Green Party agenda out there? All right, and then internal elements. Um, what we often do sometimes, folk, you know, things that we do focus on. Um, and again, you're not going to be able to cover all these things. You probably did not have, you know, strong elements of your campaign in all of these areas because it's just a lot, especially when we're sort of a small grassroots volunteer campaigns. But everything from like volunteer recruitment and management to media, fundraising, events. Um, you know, website and technology, databases, platform issues, your literature, outreach, ballot access. Um, I mean, get out the vote, all kinds of different things that you could be thinking about. And again, if you're starting from the, from the beginning and this is what you're looking at going forward, this is a great laundry list of things that you want to be developing in your campaign. Um, and Sherry's asking in the chat relationship to the party. So I think what I mean by that, let me go back for a second, um, is that, you know, some campaigns and candidates develop very independently of the party. 
and some are in some ways creations of the party. And so the relationship between the campaign and the party itself can vary. And I've seen at least in, in Philadelphia and Pennsylvania can vary from race to race year to year. And sometimes it's a very, you know, supportive relationship. And sometimes it's a fraught relationship, quite frankly. Um, and sometimes there's not a local party and there is no relationship because there's nothing, there's no infrastructure there. So I think, you know, like that's what I'm talking about is really like, you know, did this campaign, um, you know, generate a lot of party support or did it seem to be, you know, like the party was kind of like, meh, you know, lukewarm on the candidate or even, you know, um, hopefully not, you know, actively hostile. Um, but that I've seen that dynamic play out very differently over the years. And it's definitely something that you can discuss and address. Um, I'm also seeing in the chat, Michael asking about how to combat strengths and weaknesses of the opposing party. Um, I mean, I guess it's not so much, you know, you, you're obviously not in a position to change what those strengths and weaknesses are. But I think there is a way to think about, well, did we even recognize or accurately identify what the strengths and weaknesses are? How did we capitalize on those? How did we, did we adjust, um, you know, maybe our messaging as a result of it? I think sometimes greens are, sometimes we sort of have this naive, and I don't know that it's unique to the Green Party. I mean, this could be campaigning in general, but, you know, we're, I think it's, it's, important to be you know, we sometimes say like we want to be for something right not just against something right and i think that's an important part of our identity but that sometimes sometimes it also means that we kind of campaign i don't say campaign in a vacuum but you know we're sort of running with our message and almost to the exclusion of anything else that's going around you know in the in the in the context of our race right so we're sort of like doing our events and talking to our audiences, regardless of what the main opposition candidate candidate is doing. Like, are we sort of reacting um, or and and incorporating that into our campaigns? Or are we sort of running as if, you know, it like like does does our specific, you know, opposition candidate, like who that is even matter, right? Like are we running against a specific individual. I don't know if not that's making sense and we can open that up for discussion later. But I see Michael also is asking like, what do you mean by for and against? So I think what I mean that is sometimes, sometimes I think greens can get a reputation of being like, we're, we're always against something, right? Like we're so, oh, like, you know, we're against the way that Democrats and Republicans are screwing up, you know, our response to climate change, right? But it's it's a lot easier to sort of put out there what you're against, right? Like you're you're against the way we, you know, I'm against the school to prison pipeline and I'm against this like type of development in this community and I'm against, you know, um, cutting back the welfare state or whatever. Um, but what am I for? Like when I, if we were in a governing position, what are the positions that we would be promoting, right? So I think it's sometimes it's like, we are perceived as being, you know, an opposition party, right? Like a, a, a group that is sort of, you know, railing against the sta the standard, you know, the status quo. Mm -hmm. And we have, I, you know, a critique of the way things are happening. But what do we, what do we, what would we do if it was on us, right? Like, it's very easy to say, oh, that's wrong. I don't like the way you're doing that. But what would you replace it with? And so I, so sometimes I think we go in the opposite direction too much where we have, you know, this, like, this is what we're for, but we're not also kind of reading the landscape and adjusting that message to sort of the current context and what the, the you know, what the specific, um, what the specific context is for that year with this set of candidates that you're running against, if that makes sense. All right, um, skipping back ahead. Um, there's not much more of this and I do wanna get into discussion because I would love to hear about how a lot of your campaigns went. Um, so as I mentioned at the beginning, you wanna compare it to your actual, like your original goals. And ideally, if you had a campaign plan, um, you know, how did it, like, how did it, you know, it never goes according to plan, right? Like that is just sort of like life happens. 
but how much, you know, how wildly different were your projections from what actually happened? And, you know, there's like a lot of reasons for this, right? You know, sometimes our expectations are just unrealistic. Like I've talked to a lot of folks who are just like, we are going to win. And it's like, okay, how did the last three greens in this race do? Like, oh, they got 3%. Okay. And you're going to win this year because, <laughs> you know, like what's, you know, I know you're going to be more amazing than your predecessors, but to go from 3% to 50 is a pretty amazing jump. So sometimes we do have unrealistic expectations. Um, you know, a lot of times, you know, we either don't plan um, or we don't actually follow the plan, right? Like we put some general sketches out there, we have an idea and then it literally goes on the shelf and we're just so in the moment, reacting, reacting that we're not sort of going back and looking at like, well, this is, this is what we said we were gonna do and this is to, to get to the goals that we wanted. And then of course the reality, it's like sometimes circumstances are just beyond our control, right? You know, like I think anyone who made a campaign plan in January of 2020 um, pretty quickly realized that that was not going to be the way things were, right? Like things change, right? Um, and so, you know, we had a cam campaign in Pennsylvania this year where the main opposition candidate like passed away like three weeks before the election, right? So like things change, right? Um, you know, there's always something that, that is beyond our control. Um, some of the things that we can look at in our campaign plans, and again, our goals are quantitative, right? Counts of things. And then, but other things that are harder to judge and are more subjective are qualitative. Um, and so something that you might also wanna reflect on is sort of, again, looking to the future. So who are the volunteers that showed the most promise? Um, you know, sometimes we get, you know, great new, particularly young people, but people of any age who come in and this is their first campaign and they seem to kind of show an aptitude for fill in the blank, whether it's, you know, social media or website or event planning. And can we cultivate in that person, um, you know, that skill and leadership so that they're sort of willing and able to sort of do that the next time around? Um, you know, as a former treasurer, like that's a big skill that's often missing in our campaign, you know, toolboxes. If you've got someone who you've like finally got to be a great campaign treasurer, keep that person and figure out how you can get them, um, you know, like that, that's a learning like, oh, we found Sally and she's really great at being a campaign treasurer or she's like learning to be it and willing to do it. Maybe we can cultivate her for the next time around. All right. Um, so yeah, so other takeaways aside from thinking about um, you know, personnel and who who might be future promising leaders in campaigns, perhaps future promising candidates in the next time around. You know, what else did we learn? Um, there's a lot of data, hopefully, that gets generated in your campaign, whether it's you know, volunteer contact info, donor info, um, perhaps even voting analysis, like who voted for the candidate. I mean, obviously you don't know exactly who voted because we have um, secret ballot, but like what districts had higher turnout for your candidate or what precincts, um, you know, even things like, you know, I mean, I'm, there's concrete infrastructure like databases and, you know, years ago, many of us in our, in the party have, you know, used nation builder. There was a time where that was a brand new tool for us. And there was a steep learning curve on how to use it. But then the next time around, it was a lot easier to do because we now had experience with it. Um, so it could be, you know, physical tools like that, but it also could just be like, you know, practices like, oh, we're going to have a bi-weekly campaign meeting and we're going to do it on Zoom and we're going to use Google Drive and we're going to use this type of listserv and we're going to, or we're going to use Slack or whatever. You know, there's a hundred tools out there now, but sort of committing to like one set of tools and one way of working together, like that can be institutionalized and operationalized over time so that again, you don't have to reinvent even that wheel the next time out. I often think about camp running a campaign is almost like trying to open a brand new small business overnight that immediately starts, you know, serving its customers, right? Like you can't open a pizza shop in a in a week and be like churning out pizzas, right? Like you have to learn, you have to hire folks and you have to like, you know, develop a menu and advertise and figure out procurement. Like, do you have enough material? You know, but like a campaign is literally like you start and like overnight you're trying to be up and running. And it's really, it's kind of crazy when you think about it. 
And a lot of it was just like basic systems of, you know, how do we do what we do? How do we work together as a unit? Um, you know, in other contexts develop over years, right? Like, oh, in my office, we now have this bi-weekly staff meeting and this is what we talk about and this is what our agendas look like. That's developed over years. And in a campaign, it's like we days, if not weeks, where you're trying to figure this out. And so if you've got a formula that works in terms of like, just even how you communicate with each other, that's something, you know, like write that down. Like that is a, a learning. That's a thing that you can carry into a, a future campaign. Um, and then information about your opponent. You know, unfortunately, many of us don't win our races. And so the person we ran against is now the person in office. And so two years from now, four years from now, that's who we'll be running against most likely. Um, you know, some people obviously do you know, retire or move on, but you know, the power for, of the incumbency is a big deal. And chances are you might be running against the very same opponent two years, four years from now. And what did we learn about that person that we can again, carry into the next campaign? Um, which, yeah, so Greens, we're not often big on what's called opposition research. Um, it does feel very kind of negative and smarmy, but it doesn't have to be. I mean, I think there's ways to do this well and ethically. But, you know, just like who, you know, learning as much as you can about your opponents, right? Um, and not just like, oh, they're horrible on X, Y, Z issue, but getting in a little deeper, right? Like who gave that person money? Who were, endorsed them? What did they spend their money on? Um, you know, those are things that you might have in your toolbox for the next time around. Again, not in a sort of like, you know, unethical, smarmy way. We're not talking about like, you know, what people do in their privacy of their own homes, but things that matter to the voters that do impact um, how they might govern and what it says about them um, as leaders. And so again, as I mentioned, like this might be who you run against next time around, whether it's you personally running again or the Green Party as a whole. All right. Um, so I will say like some other final like words of wisdom about debriefing is that as I mentioned before, you know, campaigns can generate high emotions. Um, picking apart our losses and our challenges can also generate high emotions. It's very easy to slip into blaming people and being like, rah, 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 you didn't, you know, if you only did your job, if you only just did half of what you said you would, like we would have won, right? Um, you don't want that to happen, right? Even if it's true. Um, we need to keep things positive and make this about actions, not about people. Um, you know, there's a fine line between assigning blame and owning, like assigning responsibility. And I think just being re realistic about the time and capacity of our group, right? Like we can't hold ourselves to a standard of, you know, million dollar professionally run campaigns when we're doing things on a shoestring, you know, out of someone's garage. So just to sort of put that kind of reality check in mind. Um, and this can be hard because, you know, people are people and we're emotional creatures. Um, and, you know, when people feel very passionate about something, as most of us do, you know, it, it feels very, like it can feel personal when if somebody sort of, you know, constructive criticism, that's what I'm looking for. That can be a hard thing to achieve and have people not take it personally. Um, all right, so this is a bit more about like the relationship with the local or state party, um, since there were questions about that. Um, these are some questions to ask if you want to, if this is something that you want to debrief on. Um, so like, to what extent was your campaign connected to the local Green Party? Did you seek and receive endorsements? Did this local or state party actually actively promote your campaign? Do they provide resources, financial resources, data resources, um, you know, introductions to, to people, you know, volunteers, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, you could do a separate debrief just for the state or local party um, about how your campaign either helped build the party or, you know, or didn't. Um, and, you know, sometimes campaigns, you know, run very close to the Green Party in terms of like Green Party's on all the literature, the four pillars and the 10 key values. Like it's a really big, obvious part of the campaign. And some candidates are a little bit more circumspect about their relationship to the Green Party. 
Um, they might, you know, put themselves out more as independents. Um, maybe they're using the color green on all their lit. Maybe they're not, right? Um, it really, again, sort of just depends on the context and how that campaign came to be. But that's something also that you can think about and analyze. Um, you know, and that might be something more if you're in a party role and trying to debrief and analyze, well, how did this can candidate fare? Did this candidate do us well or did it, was it a distraction or, you know, God forbid, make us look bad or, you know, something like, like that. You know, so debriefing can be done both from the campaign perspective, but also separately from the party perspective. All right. Um, you also want to do some post campaign party building, ideally, right? So hopefully the initial exhaustion of the can like the the post election day whew, is 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 winding down and maybe people are sort of getting maybe a little bit more you know ready to kind of like get out there again um but really think about how can you pivot from the campaign into general party building and this is a really tough one um I've often said that, you know, in my experience, and this is, of course, a gross overgeneralization, but, you know, in my experience, there's two types of Green Party volunteers, right? There, there's sprinters and there's marathon runners. And the campaign is like a sprint, right? There is a finite end. It is a fast and furious 10-month race. And you've got this very concrete and specific goal, i.e. winning this office. General party building is a marathon. It is a long slog, year in, year out. Um, and there's it's a little more amorphous, right? Like there is no winning, right? There's just growing and building and growing and building. And so I often find that different people have different kind of dispositions and preferences for one versus the other and are just like, you know, they just sort of are more attuned to one way of operating more than the other. Like I myself am a marathon runner, right? Like I, you know, maybe I started as a sprinter and I got it pretty exhausted from that. Like it's hard for me personally to get motivated and geared up for any one particular race, but I'm pretty good about like maintaining a pretty steady state, like for years and years, right? That doesn't win elections you know, the sprinters are needed to like get people motivated. Like this event is the most important event. If we don't turn people out and raise this money and blah, 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 right? So you kind of need both in the party. So I guess long story short is that it's kind of hard to pivot from the, the campaign, you know, mode into party building mode, but it's something you got to try to figure out because, you know, you don't want to lose that momentum, right? You hopefully had a group of people who are made it, maybe meeting every week, every other week, who are really like putting energy into, you know, building the Green Party and some it, through this campaign. And you don't want all that to just like wither away and then have to sort of rebuild from scratch two years later. And so what are the ways that you can kind of in some ways mimic that in some ways that sprinting mentality within the marathon, if that makes sense. So, you know, and that might be things related to like local issues, right? Can you start keeping, can your campaign keep alive that momentum by instead of focusing on the race itself, like a particular local issue, right? Um, you know, and maybe it's this thing that your, you know, opposition who's now elected is doing like, oh, we've got to stop, you know, this bill from happening, or we've got to promote this thing instead, but having sort of a specific and concrete issue to sort of build on might help people pivot um, and stay engaged. Um, yeah, so you just basically want to try to keep people's energy and activity. And, you know, maybe a social event in December is a good way to do that, um, to sort of keep people, you know, like connected and, you know, working together and still seeing themselves as a Green Party volunteer. Um, you also have to realize, realize that you hopefully have built some name recognition with your campaign, even if you didn't win. And that's something that you don't want to, you know, that you, that you can build on, right? And so, like, we have a guy here in Pennsylvania. Um, he hasn't been active in a while, but for years he ran for state representative and state senate in his part of the state in Northeast Pennsylvania. I'm thinking of Jay Sweeney, Michael. Um, and, you know, he didn't win, but he 
he did well every time out. He he was he's kind of in a red part of the state. And so he was always like the most consistent, you know, left candidate that was on the ballot. And at some point, you know, like the local newspaper would ask him like, well, hey, like this thing's happening in the community. Jay, well, what do you think? Well, what's the Green Party perspective on that? He sort of made a name for himself as the person kind of representing um, you know, the alternative to the Republican Party who was in power in that part of the state. Um, and, he, you know, he kind of, you know, rode that wave for a little while. Um, he had recognition, name recognition and credibility just from his races. And so he was able to build, bring some visibility to our issues um, for a while when he was still active um, because of his campaigns. And so that's something that's another way to think about a way to um, you know, keep things kind of moving and in the in the public, um, in the public sphere. All right. Um, other things that you want to make sure you're doing after the campaign. This is not so much debriefing, but just like general, you know, tips for this moment, this stage of the of the post campaign, um, you know, arc of the year is make sure you have thanked all your people. Um, and again, multiple times, right? Volunteers, donors, supporters, um, thank them, thank them, thank them. Um, Cause you can still communicate, you know, you can still be sending out emails and period, you know, newsletters, things like, this is what I'm up to as a candidate. This is where I, what I'm gonna be spending my energy on. Please join me in the fight against X or the fight for Y. Um, you know, the, in some ways, the cycle, like off year, on year, off year, or the other way around is like run, organize, run. So like you're running your race in the even year. And then in the odd year, you're sort of building and organizing and laying the groundwork for the next run. Um, you know, you can speak at public forums, right? You ran for city council and you didn't make it, but you can still show up to city council. You can still watch their proceedings. You can still you know, write a letter to the editor and talk about, well, you know, councilman so-and-so who I ran against it just voted this way and I wouldn't have done that, right? It's that same kind of thing, sort of keeping your your name and your face in the public, um, you know, in the in the public and also, of course, putting our, our issues, the Green Party agenda and platform front and center. Um, you could be organizing public forums on issues, like there's lots of ways to continue in some ways, extend the race beyond election day. Um, and you can also, I mean, think about how you wanna, like what you're gonna do with your email list, um, you know, social media, you know, you definitely don't wanna keep it around forever, right? Especially if it's like Joe for city council 2022, like at some point that gets kind of fairly stale, but can you be like transitioning and, you know, cross posting and cross promoting with the party so that you can kind of be moving your audience towards, you know, the other like long-term party channels. Um, so that's something to think about. All right, and then is, you know, this is a little bit of a recap and I think this is the last slide I'd really like to get it open for dialogue is again, how to like thinking about that pivot from the campaign to the party building. And ideally, hopefully your your platform, your campaign platform will sort of give you some guidance on that. What were the issues that you ran on? Well, they're probably still issues. They didn't magically all get solved on November 8th. And so how can you continue um, to be, you know, active and, you know, mobilizing around those issues? Um, you know, and the other thing is to think about, you know, the the candidate, right, has to kind of make that handoff, right? If people were excited about the candidate, you know, like people get excited about campaigns for a variety of reasons. A small minority of us are really passionate about the policies and the party. The great majority of people get really excited about the person, right? Like they're fans of Jill Stein, they're fans of Matthew Ho, whatever. Um, yeah, they like the Green Party too, but like the person is really what's moving them. And so that person is the one that really in some ways needs to make the invitation and the ask and say like, please give your, continue to give your, give your support to the party now. Um, it's those personal, like that personal appeal that really matters. Um, and that's it. So I'm, I think I'm gonna stop there. 
Um, I would love to have open discussion. Um, I'd love to hear from folks about whether they've been able to do any debriefing, um, if they've been a part of something like that, um, what their thoughts are, how they might take any of this information moving forward. I know some of you have run many times before. So yeah, I'm just happy to like open the floor and have a general discussion. And Michael, um, and I think you might have missed introductions at the beginning. So if you just want to introduce yourself first, that would be great. Hi, uh, my name is Michael Penn. I live in Washington, D.C. I am he, I, he slash him. So I noticed that, you know, looking at the last election, the midterms, uh, why Democrats, why Democrats have won, why Democrats have lost. And this is very important for the Green Party uh, to really focus on because, like you said um, early, early on, Hillary Kane. And thank you for spreading that information and giving like a deep root analysis of what the Green Party did really well in the campaigns, what areas they need to work on. And I think that what I've noticed and what I've analyzed, even not only for among Greens, but among progressives, why do Republicans and modern Democrats keep winning every elections every year? And not only keep winning elections every year, but they keep implementing very bad policies that really damage, you know, that really damage America's uh, democracy. And by the way, we're not a re democracy, we're a republic. And I figure Republicans, what they do a good, very good job with is when they develop talking points and they run a campaigns, they adjust their talking points to the changing circumstances. In other words, they double down. And I think this is where the Greens and Democrats lack. They never double down on their talking points. In other words, you got to develop like strong counter arguments or, str or strong uh, counter talking points. Like for example, I'll give you an example of issue, like Medicare for all. So we keep saying like under Medicare for all, Americans have freedom of choice, right? That's great. They'll be able to, they don't have to worry about premiums, deductibles, co-pays and concerns. And every time we say that, I noticed that uh, private interest groups, including Republicans and Democrats, demonize Medicare for all or destroy the ca a campaign because they advertise opposition. What we lack is advertising Medicare for all on like TV ads. You watch TV every day. Why do you think a lot of people are telling, uh, telling constituents, please call your member of Congress. Vote no against Joe Biden's uh, Inflation Reduction Act, right? Or the Drug Pricing Negotiation Act. I don't see any like campaign ads advertising Medicare for all by uh, by asking for money, and we need to become a, we need to do a better job of becoming lobbyists. I'm not saying lobbyists to fo to protect mm -hmm. private interests, but we need to be lobbyists for the public uh, good, and that's what we're lacking in, because yeah. a lot of organizations, I participate for Medicare for all. One organization that doesn't want to ask for a donation is NNU, which is the National National Nurses. I'm sorry, National. Nurses United, and I thought that would, that's very interesting because I've seen other organizations from mm -hmm. Ecuador ask for donations. That's how to advertise. And when we don't focus on money, we're not going to um, achieve our agendas. And also the agenda on the um, on reparations. I want I want to emphasize. It, I read something in the, in the uh, platform that said about HR forty. Black voters don't want to study on reparations. What they want is tangibles. We know what sure. we know what happened in the past. They're demanding attends reparations to be issued through executive order. We don't need a study because the study is like, so we have a debate if, if reparations be given to black descendants of slavery or not, right. or if the yeah. slavery exists, no. We know that it exists already among uh, black voters and not only the reparations that needs to be, that needs to be doubled down, but also it needs to include a, a black agenda. Yeah, That's so I think, her. Sorry to yes, cut you sorry. off. I just want to keep moving the conversation along, but I think you raised some good points. I mean, thinking about what is going on in the sort of broad strokes of the electorate, like why do Republican messages seem to be, you know, landing well with this audience, but not over here? What are the Democrats doing? Like, we do have to, you know, think about what's going on in the bigger picture. I mean, you know, I, I'm a reader. I like, you know, to read political analysis. Um, I just happened to finish reading Ezra Klein's Why We're Polarized, which to me was kind of interesting. And off, you know, I don't necessarily agree with everything he wrote, but there were some insightful pieces in there about why Republican messaging and Democratic, and, and not just messaging, but strategies are very different. 
And it's something, you know, like kind of was like, oh, like that makes sense. And how do we fit in as the Green Party? And like, what's our position in this larger ecosystem? Um, yeah, other thoughts or comments? I would love to hear, especially from those of you who actually ran for office this year. You can't win on 250 bucks. That is true. Uh, almost <laughs> nothing in this country, <laughs> even dog catcher of a population five town, probably takes more than 250 bucks this year um, with inflation, right? Um, no, seriously, I think you, yeah, like that is something that for a lot of greens is sort of the sobering reality check of just like how hard how much money is in these races? It's kind of obscene. And um, yeah, we have to figure that, like there's got it there. We have to figure out a way to um, be able to compete seriously without selling out to the, you know, the highest corporate bidder. So that's, that's definitely something we got to work on. Um, I will add too, um... yeah. Many of these, you know, this, this webinar is designed for all the bells and whistles of the kind of race you'd want to run at the top level. And it's really good to know all this, but smaller races, well, I went smaller races, you know, like many of us live in these, in smaller towns, rural areas, um, or they, we, we go down ticket races and you're not going to use all those bells and whistles. And, and you're talking about sure. party building and party building is, is good to get the um, volunteers and all, all the stuff but uh, involved. You want that, but you also, um, people maybe all nonpartisan, and that's often the races we win so people you want people to know you're green and, and you put that message out there but you know the degree to which you're advertising that is going to change but i just wanted to mention this because sometimes you don't really need to raise you're going to really need to raise some but you don't necessarily need to be aiming for huge amounts of money but that's going to depend on um what would it really take to win that many votes or what that goal what do you think how many media hits how much how much of that would be so um Yes. Could I, I have a question. Who is um, area code 505? I don't know, but they raised their hand. So I was going to call okay. them the next. I think I know, but go ahead. Whoever's joining us by phone with the 505 area code. Okay. Yeah. Hi, it's M. Oh, That's hey, M. Long time no see. Nice to see you or hear you. In this case. Yeah. Um, and I'm sorry, I was late uh, to the meeting tonight. Um, but happy to join and hear what I did here. Um, and so I had, I did, first I wanted to make, and if it was already discussed or mentioned earlier, I apologize. Um, but I did want to make a point when it comes to the money is like, that's sort of one of the things that greens are against is all the money in politics and pay for play. So as hard as it is, especially with media blackouts, I think a lot of times just, you know, hit up the neighborhood groups, um, try to speak at neighborhood meetings, especially on local races, um, you know, take advantage of what Hillary mentioned before, like opportunities to speak in public and bring up important points, especially controversial issues that are before the county commission or before the city council, um, things like that. Uh, Cause like, I don't know, I know Hillary, one time you put together something or CCC put together something. It was part of your show is like something, something, how to look like a pro when the budget is low or something like that. Um, do you still have that in the I don't think that was me, but I do remember that title. So we must have, I probably have that presentation somewhere saved and recorded. But um, yeah, I mean, it's what we call earned media, right? Like the media that you earn from being, you know, newsworthy, right? Um, but yeah, there are some techniques and things that you can do to sort of, you know, boost your um your image even on a low budget um but yeah i mean like i think that you know and i see michael your hands up and i want to get to your comment next but the money thing is hard because you know 
uh, for at least personally, it's not that we want no money in politics. I mean, that's certainly like an aspirational idea, but like we don't want big money, right? Like we don't want outsized corporate influence. We don't want the millionaire who's buying the candidate, right? That doesn't mean that there should be no money and that raising a million dollars is inherently an evil thing. Like if you raise a million dollars from like a hundred thousand small donors, like to me, that's like an important testament to how popular and, you know, important your message is, right? Like, I think there's different ways to think about it. So, I mean, look, I think there's a critique to be made, like, you know, in a society that can't feed all our citizens, is it appropriate to spend $6 billion on a Senate race, right? Like, no, but that doesn't, like, we can't shy away from all money, right? Like, it's not, you know, like, <laughs> people have, we have a very, um, we have a lot of hangups in our culture about money and like how we interact with it. But, you know, I think about it this way, like you want your message out. Well, that's flyers, that's advertising, that's, you know, people going door to door, passing out something that costs money to make. And so it's about getting the message out and that takes resources and you need enough, right? You don't need like millions and billions just to have millions and billions, but you need enough money to get that message out effectively across your whole district. And if your district is 600,000 people, like that's a lot of money, right? And so, you know, like we're obviously not gonna be raising billions, but like we should have aspirations to raise more than 250 bucks and then call it like a point of pride about how like grassroots and, you know, shoe leather express our campaign was because $250 isn't even buying lawn signs. All right, my rant is over on that. Um, Michael, and then Betsy is on staff next. Yeah, the money thing. Um, I got I got some experience with that. <laughs> we we ran up basically a no no dollar campaign this time. Uh, I mean, it was a lot of in kind donations, uh, but we we didn't do very well either. So I, I, there's that. But I also know that two years ago I ran. Um, and I, we did we did really well. Uh, we got about twenty percent of the vote. Um, I outraised my opponent uh, by three times. I mean, an incumbent <laughs> Republican. Uh, but I think the key to Green Party running is that we are in fact a grassroots group, and we need to mobilize uh, our our people. So when I've done best as a candidate, it's when not when I raised the most money, but when I, I did a better job of mobilizing in my community. I've held elected office since 1989. Um, I live in a small community, but my neighbors know me. It's, it's, it's if you want to call it, it's Trump country, uh, but I'm a green that's been elected constantly and, and it, since 1989 uh, because my neighbors knew, know who I am. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm knocking on their doors. I, I show up in the community. I, 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 I know my, I know my, my neighbors. So I, I think that that's an important thing too, that as a, a green, we need, to, we need to turn out folks. Uh, and we do that by, by being good neighbors, by, by showing up, by making our uh, neighbors know who we are. So I think that's an important thing. Money's, money's important, but the more important thing is to be the grassroots group. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And I think that consistency of, um, you know, showing up and also I'm sure doing what you said you're going to do, right? Like you're not just a nice guy, but you actually govern effectively. And, you know, when you say you're going to do something, you do it and people respect that. And that's why you're getting elected year after year. Um, so thank you for that. Um, Betsy, your hand is up. So I'm fortunate here in Maine, we have a clean elections program and you have to raise a certain, you have to um, get a certain number of $5 donations, 60 $5 donations, and then you get a, a tranche of money to run your campaign. I had $5,500 to run my campaign, which bought all the postcards and palm cards and lawn signs that I needed, plus paid for mileage driving around my very rural district. Um, so money, yeah, money is important. And I, and I think that one thing that the Green Party could do is try to expand the clean elections um, program to more states. I think it's us in New Mexico at this point that have um, publicly funded elections um, that give you, I mean, it, it's not a lot of money, but it's, it was definitely enough. I'm, I think I'm gonna be giving back about $500. 
and I had everything I needed for the campaign. So, um, you know, if we're going to talk about election reform and getting more Green Party candidates elected, then we should be talking about getting clean elections expanded to more states than just Maine and New Mexico. Yeah, amen to that. I mean, that's great. So you basically, you, you raised $300 and that got you 5,500 in public support. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, I, I got, um, you could have, have seed money ahead of time. And I had like a thousand dollars in seed money from folks, friends and family around yeah. the country. And then, um, and then I got the, the 60 checks and got the $5,500. That's so. great. The great yes. system. Yes, we definitely need more of that all across the country, for sure. Um, Tanner? Yeah, um, I think, so what I want to say is that um, money is, I think it's crucial, uh, raising money. And I would, so I uh, helped um, the Maryland candidate and we were uh, trying to fundraising and all this stuff. And when you see the other candidates, Democrats and Republicans, they raised literally hundreds of thousands of dollars and that money turns back to them. So they, it's, so if you, if you spend more money, you win more money. So I think we could start thinking about not being humble and really have big, big uh, aspirations to have more, uh, more money for the campaign. For example, a candidate that will, is gonna run probably will need to leave his job or her job uh, for 12 months. And depending on the state you're living in, it could cost you $100,000, $50,000, or even $200,000. Plus, if you don't win, that's gonna, maybe you're gonna be unemployed for six, eight months. And we, we, you never know if the recessions come that could even up, up to a couple of years without employment. So add another 100,000 or $200,000. So they can, a candidate itself will need that money for running. And then just calculate the advertising, the yard sales, uh, the uh, yard um, signs, postcards and all other stuff. We, I think we need to start talking about how to raise at least half a million dollars to run for any big positions and, and have the aspiration, big objective. And then maybe you will raise $200,000, but your goal is at least it should be uh, half a million dollars. That's my opinion. Thank you. I, so I think one of the things that you bring up that is maybe it's less of a candidate debriefing reflection conversation, but more of a party debriefing and reflection conversation is just what level of office should we even be running at right now, given where we're at, right? Because I think you're right. Like if you're going to run for governor or Senate, half a million dollars is a real, is a low budget campaign that is, you know, it should be within our grasp. It, re it realistically, it hasn't been, but it should be. But if, if that's what it takes to run for that level, if maybe we shouldn't yet be putting our effort, you know, like there's a bunch of reasons to run for statewide office, some of its ballot access, you know, and just literally keeping the flame alive on the party and giving voters, you know, an option, right? But that's a different kind of race than like running to win, or at least like really change the conversation and become like a political force, right? And so thinking like that's a level of conversation that we often don't have is just strategically, what are the levels of office that we even want to concentrate on, right? And so I think that's, yeah, like it's just like your comment makes me think about that. It's an important conversation to be having. Um, all right, I saw M's hand and then we'll go back to Michael and then maybe we'll try to close it out. It's a little after, it's almost 10, 15 on the East Coast. Um, so M, you're next. Well, I just uh, wanted to, being from New Mexico, um, on the public financing thing um, in New Mexico, that's like, it's not 
statewide for all races. There are like certain, well, in, like municipal elections in Albuquerque can be public financing, but you find out that people don't want to go around and collect the $5 or they have difficulty collecting the $5. So then they just do private funding and actually get more money um, than the public uh, trough, even though it's a nice chunk of change. Um, well, sometimes they get more money, depends on the candidate. Uh, and like, I think public education, I don't know if it's public education or public regulatory commission um, that also had that. And I think some judges had f public financing. I'm not 100% sure. Um, but like the PRC, that used to be, it's one of the, it's a state office, but there are districts, there are like five districts. So it wasn't a statewide office. But in the past, Greens had done really well in that, like getting 40% of the vote in one particular election. Um, but um, in New Mexico, that just went away because the Public Regulatory Commission uh, is now going to be a, a, a body appointed by the governor. Um, so, you know, we were against that, but it's happening anyway. And the lawsuit just got denied today that was trying to overturn that change. Um, but uh, I know you want to wrap this up. There was one other point I was going to make in that is like we're talking about elections and stuff and something that we've seen in New Mexico recently is a lot of people, especially like when you know, say in 2016, when a lot, a lot, a lot of people were very unhappy with the, what happened on a national level. And so lots of younger people and um, particularly like young working women and stuff started running for office. And a lot of them were successful and then got elected. And then they find out just how much work it is, um, like at state level, like a house rep or something in New Mexico, we have citizen legislatures, and so there isn't a salary. So you basically lose income to serve. And then people are deciding, some people are just resigning their positions. Um, and so then there are vacancies that have to be filled. And depending on where the position is, um, vacancies, if like they're, if they're appointed by a public body, then that's a tremendous opportunity, I think, for people from minor parties to actually, you know, it's a small chance, but a chance exists without having to run an expensive race where you're going to get outspent. You know, you can, qualified people can go before public bodies and actually be nominated for office, whether or not they get appointed or not. Um, I mean, because that's actually we're doing that right now. And I'm one of the people who's applying for an open house seat after applying for an open Senate seat is because people are resigning. Um, and it happened to be my district. So. Um, so there. Are, so I don't know if people see that in other states or if that's unique to New Mexico, because we don't have paid legislators, they get a per diem. Um, but like you don't earn a salary if you're a state rep or a state senator in New Mexico. So I don't know if it's different elsewhere, but that's another opportunity to actually get into a public office without the election. Yeah. I'm done. Um, yeah. No, that's great. That's a great point. I know that it varies wildly across the country. Um, like I'm in the opposite corner of the world where in Pennsylvania, I think our state legislature has the highest salaries of any state legislature in the country. Um, but there are many states where it's more like your system where it is, you know, it's, um, you know, it sort of harkens back to the way it maybe was in the 1800s, where it was a very part time, like the legislature only sat for two months of the year and people went back to their home communities and, um, I think even Texas has like a very part-time citizen legislature. So it really varies across the country, but that's kind of an interesting phenomenon that people's like sort of post-2016 righteous indignation got them as far as the election, but like the reality that set in a year later was like, oh, I 
have to actually do this work. And it's, but yeah, I mean, I think people, you know, it's kind of hard to do with little to no compensation. Um, interesting. Well, good luck. Let us know if you get appointed because that, you know, we will count that as a win and, you know, certainly promote the hell out of it. Um, all right. I see the two Michaels, Michael Pan and then Michael Kerr. So, yeah, so speaking, you know, regarding where the green, where, regarding, regarding what, what we should do moving forward, regarding like, you know, if it's a focus at the federal level, uh, state and local level, I say we need to focus on both because state and local level, levels, I'm sorry, state and local elections matter more than federal, not to say federal are not important, because state, state elections do have implications for federal elections, you know, moving forward or moving to the future. When a state like when a state governor proposes tax cuts uh, for the extremely rich people, it's going to have implications for federal lawmakers, you know, down the road, whether to follow the state or not in that direction. And also regarding like, you know, you know, marketing campaign, I said in the uh, chat section, we really need to learn from Donald Trump about how to market campaigns aggressively, how to manipulate the media, and make it gain and make, make manipulate the media and make sure that it comes in our favor because Donald Trump does an excellent job of destroying his opponents like fire you know what I mean like he doesn't care what the opponents think of him and I think that's very important we need to stress because if we really want to win big we need to borrow a playbook from Donald Trump when I say borrow a playbook I'm not necessarily saying like let's borrow like bad policies from him but but let's borrow like strategies ideas from his playbook, just like how Republicans have a contract with America. And the country of America is very, very concrete, uh, very specific. And we need to do that as Greens. We have excellent ideas, we do. We're very passionate about uh, people, but I do think that we need to recruit, uh, we need to like consult with, Repub with Republican uh, campaign managers, how they market their campaigns, how they got the ball rolling and how they effectively attack their opponents because they could give us keys and strategies and clues how we can maneuver quickly but also be wise um, as uh, as well. Interesting. Um, yeah, I think for some of us, the medium or so the message is the medium in some ways. Like, I don't know that I can just simply divorce Trump's style from his politics. And I don't know that I would advise that we just sort of adopt his same style, but for a different set of policies. Like, I don't know that that's, you know, for me, ideologically consistent, but I will say there's some interesting analysis of like what makes Trump kind of unique and different or interesting in this um, Ezra Klein book. And one of the things that he talks about that I think, you know, a lot of people, a lot of like Democrats did a lot, so much hand wringing after 2016 and sort of painted Trump as this aberration that, you know, like, like he needed to be explained, you know, like, um, and that and if you actually look at the data, like there's nothing um, that different about his victory, that in some ways it's like perfectly consistent with our politics and our system. And I don't know, there's a lot of interesting analysis in there about Trump, which I don't necessarily want to go into on this call, but um, I think there's definitely things that Greens can be learning from across the political spectrum. Um, and I will just leave it at that. And then Michael Kerr, maybe you might give us our the last word. Well, I guess we'll get one more comment from Tanner and then we're done. Uh, Michael. Yes. Um, well, this is the second time I ran for Congress. Uh, I ran in 2020. There was a Republican on the ballot, and uh, I got 7.5% uh, in the primary. Uh, this time, the uh, Republicans don't spend any party doesn't spend any money on, on, on Republicans in this district. Um, and they usually locals wait for someone just to run a run. Um, and it two days before the deadline, uh, uh, an immigrant from Ukraine signed up to be the candidate. And it turns out that you needed seven years citizenship. So he got disqualified. Uh, so I was by myself with a, uh, a well-liked uh, 
quote unquote progressive Democrat, um, who I personally know and everything. Uh, and there was no media attention whatsoever in the media. And 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 actually I got no attention in the on the uh, progressive media either. Um I the green local Green Party and stuff are dis and the and the county one are dysfunctional. And I, I got no I got no endorsement from any Green Party at all or any help. Uh there were 1,600 registered Green Party people in my in my district. I uh, actually text messaged 900 of them that I had phone numbers for, and I only got one response, uh, and that was somebody that already knew me. Um, I, I did raise $1,800 from friends, and and I put in about 4,500 on my own. I bought 20,000 uh, uh, full color, uh, eight and a half by 11 brochures. And and distributed them door to door with my partner, and uh, so I'm waiting for precinct results to uh, find out how that went. Uh, There's 450,000 registered voters in the district, and I was it, with my brochures. I was probably able to reach about 10 percent, but I concentrated in one city. So I'll see how I did. With I had a very uh, a brochure that's. Uh, you know, some a lot of people didn't like uh, as far not the information, but my front page. But my theme was that the uh, military-industrial complex owns both parties and the media, and a lot more. And and my log slogan was censorship and truth are not compatible. Um, so I, the district's twenty-five percent Republican and twenty-five percent. Uh, uh, no party preference, I guess, and independents and 50% Democrats. And my brochure was trying to attract Republicans, independents, and, and disaffection uh, Democrats. Um, so I got I got 15 a little less than 15% in the primary. And in the general here, I've gotten 21%, 55,000 votes. Um, so I, I think I improved 6%. I was looking for 25% Great. because that's what the uh, Republicans usually get. So I got close to what a Republican candidate would have gotten without even, and, and the Republicans don't have to do anything. They just get because they're a Republican. Okay, mm -hmm. so. Thank yeah, you for that's all, all that. I want. Yeah, thank <laughs> you. All right, Tanner, you're gonna get the last word. You wanna close us out? That honor to the last word. It was not my intention, but uh, first of all, I really would like to congratulate all the candidates that had the courage to um, run for office, even though knowing the difficulties to be elected as a Green Party candidate. So the the reason of my um, support to Green Party is my obsession of the environment. I'm literally obsessed with plastics. Um, and every single time that I buy something from the grocery store, I need to use plastics and it hurts my uh, everything because I know that will end up uh, contaminating the environment in uh, some certain way. So, but when, when I see the Green Party, the um, the, um, the topics that we are focusing, I don't see. Unfortunately, I I, I see lots of things that will uh, is um, distracting the public opinion about the Green Party. Um, lots of topics that for some people are dogmas, very uh, untouchable things. And I know, personally know people that just don't want green because of something. So what I um, would like to maybe open a discussion or, or Green Party to open the discussion to not focus on those kind of things and try to get, and this would surprise you maybe, 
instead of Democrat votes, concentrate in Republican votes. Even though the, uh, for example, is a, is a state, is a district that is a Republican candidate is running. And historically, they didn't, for the last 12 years, 16 years, no Republican won that. Even though could, we could approach the Republican Party and say, hey, would you consider withdrawing your candidacy just to support us? Because you, I, I, we know your intention is just to damage the Democratic Party. So you can make more damage on the Democratic Party by supporting us. And how you can do that? You just withdraw your, your um, candidacy and, and you, just, you can just endorse ourselves. And we are supporting these ideas. And as you can see, we are not in contradiction of your belief system or with what you're supporting of. So we could have, we could reach much more votes by um, align, not aligned because they have different ideas, of course, but just don't touch the topics that they are very sacred for them. Um, I, don't, I don't know if I, if, if I could explain. So, um, Instead of touching those kind of arguments, topics for, for a lot of people, that is very, very important. And they keep them away from the uh, Green Party because our intention, if, if the Green Party, in my understanding, is for environment. So if we can focus only on environment and not touch um, those feelings of other people, I think we could do a lot of progress uh, in this way. That was my, uh, what I wanted to share. I'm muted, um, so thank you for that. Um, I don't wanna open up a whole nother can of worms. I will just say, I think for many of us, Tanner, the Green Party is not just about the environment. It's about that and so much more. And we see all those issues as interconnected. And so we can't, um realize our vision giving up one piece of the platform in order to get another piece like it just doesn't work that way so but you know i think that all this requires you know more conversation and discussion and you know the context is different in different places um i don't think there are any easy wins and um i also like we've had instances where knowingly or unknowingly, we've gotten help from the Republican Party in Pennsylvania, and it's like caused us serious reputational damage. Um, whether, you know, whether it was strategic in the moment, and what that long term fallout has been is, you know, is something to, to think about as well. Anyway, all right. So thank you very much, everyone, for your time and energy tonight. It's been great to hear about the campaigns and to get to know more folks from across the country. Um, I did put in the chat earlier on, I can put it again, the link to the presentation if people want to have um, that handy to look at. So let me, I'll do that again. Um, let me grab that link. And then I also put the link most recently to just basically our webinar archive. Um, previous webinars that we've done for years um, that um, some have also links to slide decks and, um, you know, other topics, particularly if you're thinking about running for office in 2023, there's a couple good ones on like, so you want to run for office and it's kind of like entry, you know, introduction to running for office. Um, so I think that's it. I don't, I think we might have another call, Holly, next week. That's more of an open discussion. I don't know. Um, I'll leave that to you and we'll put it out on our list if that does happen. So folks will know about it. We're not sure. We're not sure when yet. It might be as early as next week, but it might be in a couple of weeks. Um, trying not to get too far into the holiday season, but we had some people, um, a, a poll went out and we got very little feedback, but some people and some of the current candidates were interested in doing this now and um, some were not able to. And then we heard later that, oh, I wanted to do it. So we're gonna try it again. 
uh, maybe like Hillary said, a little bit more open discussion or maybe even hearing people break down their campaigns. Um, so we will be looking into this. And um, so really want to thank everyone for coming and for the interest and for the input, especially of candidates who whose experience has been um, really invaluable. Uh, so so and, and also thank you for the chat comments too, Sherry and others who put in a lot of good stuff. So thank you very much. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Have a great Happy rest of the of the year. Thank you, Hillary. Happy Very nicely presented, as usual. Happy Thanks. birthday, Holly. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank happy you. birthday, Holly. I did not. Sorry for forgetting. Well, happy forgetting. Facebook banned me from putting my birthday on when I made myself 181 years old. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're 181, you look pretty darn good. Thank you. I'm not going to tell you how old I really am because it might okay. not. <laughs> All right. Sounds yeah. good. Good night, everyone. Bye. Bye.